Hello and welcome to the Freakish Lemon video podcast. I am your host, the Freakish Lemon. I go by Adrian. I use masculine pronouns. Welcome to any new viewers who clicked on whatever you clicked on to get here. And to any returning viewers, welcome back. Thank you so much for following along with this thing that I do. This is a crafty type podcast coming to you from an area of the United States that includes parts of the Tonksas, Pagusset, and Mohican homelands in the Northwest Hills of Connecticut. This podcast episode has closed captioning and transcripts are available in the show notes, which can be found over at freakishlemon.com or freakishlemonpodcast.com. They go to the same place. Um, we have a group over on Ravelry. You can search Freakish Lemon in the groups tab and you will find us. Uh, you can follow me as Freakish Lemon at Instagram and Ravelry, and all the links to these things will be in the down bar here on YouTube or somewhere around here if you're watching this somewhere else. And if you are here on YouTube and you want to follow along with what I do, please consider hitting that subscribe button down there, maybe even that notification bell, if you want to. No pressure. <laughs> Uh, I'm filming this on Sunday, September 29th, 2019, but by the time that you see this, it will be October, which means it is snazzy Halloween shirt season, uh, which is the first year I get to do this because I made this shirt in, like, March or something. I don't remember when, but it was early this year, so huzzah for Halloween shirt. Um, so we're going to start this podcast off. Usually I have podcast stuff here, but I don't have any podcast stuff. I'm going to do a recap of the Western Connecticut Yarn Crawl, which uh, is an annual yarn crawl in Western Connecticut. Um, and this year it ran from Thursday, September 19th through Sunday, September 22nd. Um, this is one that my mother and I attend every year and we have for about six years now so it's not going to be a real in-depth look at this yarn crawl because I've gone over it many 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 times <laughs> if you want to go through back episodes um but if you do have any questions about any of these stores please feel free to ask because it is festival season people are traveling for festivals they're going to be in and around this area also Thanksgiving is coming up, which means a lot of travel around, so if you want to stop at any of these stores while you're traveling through Connecticut and you have any questions, feel free to reach out. So like I said, this is an annual yarn crawl. Um, it's usually six to seven stores. There were seven stores this year. Um, this year the passport was free. I don't know what I did. No, had to hand it in. That's what I did with my passport. Um, and it's just a, basically a piece of paper threefold into a little brochure thingy with the information of the stores, their addresses, uh, what time the stores are open during the crawl, um, a place to for each store to stamp or mark as you visit them, and then places for your name, phone number, whatever, so that you can be entered in to win the grand prize that all stores um, contribute towards. So the passport was free. In previous years it was $5 because it contained patterns and recipes and things. Um, but they did a, something a little different this year. They decided to do the passport free and then for $5 you could buy oops, this tote bag with a sheep on it and each store had their own buttons made this year so that you can put it on your tote bag. Um, it's wanting to look at my face. Stop looking at my face. You can see there's, there's these little like fluff shapes and there were seven of them, one for each store. Um, side note, if the camera is doing anything weird this episode it's because I'm filming on a new camera. Uh, I did find a good deal on a Canon G7X Mark II 
on eBay. Um, so for my project specific videos, I have this and I wanted to see how it worked filming uh, for the podcast. But yeah, so $5 for this tote bag. And actually the, the shop owner that I bought it from very kindly uh, took the price of this bag off of what I bought in her shop um, because she's great. So yes, each store had a pin with their logo and you could pin it to your bag as you went along the crawl, which was super cool uh, and also made my mom and I do a lot of double checking. Like, did my pins fall off? Do I have them all? <laughs> because <laughs> we just didn't want to lose them. Um, so that was really cool. And that's a super cool idea, especially if you're a smaller crawl. Um, the, the one we do in June is 11 stores, so that would get a little cumbersome to get a design where you could fit all 11 stores, especially if you want to do something like a sheep. Um, but for seven stores, that's pretty... Pretty great. And now I have this whole tote bag with all these buttons on it. So we only did the crawl for two days uh, be because we've been to these stores a lot. Um, so I took Friday off of work and we went on Saturday. So on Friday we started at Westport Yarns in Westport, Connecticut. I uh, didn't buy anything at this location. I was anticipating that there would be a trunk show because there was one written in the brochure passport thing, but I think it was only on Saturday, uh, which I either didn't read or it didn't say. I don't recall. Um, but it's a kind of a smaller store and Westport is a, a pretty expensive area, so the prices in that store are a little higher than uh, everywhere else and nothing leapt out at me so I didn't end up buying anything at that store and then we went to Nancy O in Ridgefield Connecticut who uh moved to a new location it's just down the street from where they were but they're in kind of a little a little like walking plaza area where you park your car and then there's these little avenues of shops um it's a great location. It's a bigger store, um, which means the aisles are wider. It's easier to get around in there. It could be a little tight in their old location, um, especially on yarn crawl day. Uh, but it was really nice. Um, I didn't buy anything in the store either, but mom bought something. So, so it didn't feel like we were just like stamping and running. <laughs> That's the thing about these yarn crawls, you always feel a little bit guilty when you don't buy something in the store, even if, you know, even if there's nothing that is really grabbing you or there's nothing that you need. Which can be a little tricky, especially towards the end of the year when we're coming up on Rhinebeck's in a few weeks and New England Fiber Festival is at the beginning of November, and those are my two big ones, so... Uh, and then we went up to A Stitch in Time in Bethel, Connecticut. Gabby uh, from Once Upon a Corgi Yarns was doing a trunk show there uh, throughout the weekend. She is also my sister. Um, and we ended up turning into the driveway basically at the same time, which was really funny. We, we waved at each other at the stoplight uh, <laughs> from opposite directions. And um, she had had the trunk show set up the day prior for the Thursday crawlers, but they do their knit night on Thursdays, so the shop owners cleared the table where her stuff was, and so, and they were so funny, because they were, they were like, I hope we didn't mess anything up, and she was just like, I gotta set it all up again, even if you did, so it's not that big of a deal, but because we were there, we immediately jumped in, helped set up, you know, for the first 10 minutes of being in the store, which I think, um, I think the shop owner forgot <laughs> that she was my sister slash she is my mother's daughter <laughs> because I feel like we've done that a couple of years now where it's like no she's my sister and there she's like oh that makes sense <laughs> one of those things uh, but I did end up buying at a stitch in time in Bethel um, because this shop really 
they have a lot of you know your staple items that you need um but they also do have a section for indie dyers and they they have gabby's yarn there a lot of the time they have 100 ravens which is also a local um dyer i think she's out of massachusetts but um but yeah she likes to get indie dyed yarns into the shop and uh the name was familiar on this one, but I couldn't place where I'd heard it before. But this is a skein of yarn that leaped out at me. And that hasn't happened in a very long time. A single skein has not leaped out at me in a long time. So this nice fall color. This is um, Meadowcroft Dye Works Yarn Rehab. I think that's... I get the impression that's what they call their wholesale that they send to local yarn stores because uh, the tag is rehabilitation for the yarn bereft at your local yarn store. <laughs> um, this is the Rock Shelter Sock base in uh, color 61 Remembrance or wow Rembrandt's. Read with your eyes please pay attention Adrian. Rembrandt's Prodigal Son. So I'm guessing this is based off of a Rembrandt painting. Um, it's 100% superwash merino, but these colors just screamed at me and I couldn't walk away from this skein of yarn. Can I get it to focus? Oh yes. And then Gabby helpfully reminded me that I that she thinks I have some of this like rusty red color in my stash and she may be right. So <laughs> this may have friends or maybe a single skein project, I don't know. And then from Bethel, we swung up to Southington, Connecticut to go visit New England Yarn and Spindle, which we wouldn't normally do. Usually we do Westport, Ridgefield, Bethel, and that's it for the day. Um, usually New England Yarn and Spindle we do with the Northern stores, but Yarn Crawl Weekend was the same weekend as uh, Bristol, Connecticut's Mum Festival. Um, and Bristol is, in bet is between where we live and the Southington store. We figured the traffic, because of road closures and rerouting around the festival, would be better on Friday during the day when a lot of folks are in school. Um, also, we usually finish up at Bethel close to lunchtime, and there's an IHOP just down the street from New England Yarn and Spindle, so, pancakes for lunch. Which is always good. And we love going to see Mary, so we wanted to make sure that we spent some time there. Um, I did end up buying from Mary. Um, she's the shop owner. Um, her store used to be in Bristol. Uh, so, her store was our most local yarn store for a long time. Um... So I always like to see her and catch up. I did buy this skein of Cascade Heritage Sock, which is a 75% superwash merino wool and 25% nylon. Um, and I bought this, not with a particular project in mind, but my brain has been moving towards hand knitting, more complicated things, more cables, more color work, uh, because I do have the machines for plain stockinette things. Um, and when I was taking stock of my stash earlier in the year, I did notice that I have very, very few light contrasting colors. Um, I have a lot of mid-tones, I have a lot of dark tones. I do not have light colors. And this one jumped out at me. I don't know if the camera will really show it, because I don't have the studio lighting. There's nothing really white to hold it up against, but it's a soft, soft, just barely gray. It's not a true white, uh, which I think would really stand out harshly against a lot of the colors in my stash, but this kind of very soft gray I think would work very well as a contrasting color. 
and I was very excited to find that at her shop. Um, and that was Friday. Then Saturday, we went to the new store of this crawl, and that is Stars Hollow Yarns in New Preston, Connecticut. They just opened last December, um, which is very exciting. It's a very nice shop, and I really wish them the best of luck. Um, they are currently so showcasing, I don't know if it was just for the crawl or if it's, you know, for this month or for this quarter or whatever, but they definitely for the crawl, they were showcasing, um, uh, BIPOC dyers, which was great. So they had the farmer's daughter fibers, they had lady dye yarns, and they had cashmere people, which is a business started by women in... Oh, I've forgotten. It started with a T and it ended in a stan. I could look this up. Tajikistan. Uh, and some in Afghanistan. Um, yes, they hand spin, they hand dye. Um, cashmere and Kashgora goat yarns. Um, because they raise them out there. And, um, yeah, so they, they started a company and they sell, um, ethically sourced, environmentally conscious yarns from Turk, uh, Tajikistan and Afghanistan, which is very cool. And they had all that front and center and that was really cool to see actually in a shop. Um, just some accessibility points because I have done this for some previous shops. Uh, there are steps to get into the store. Um, so if you are wheelchair bound, I didn't see any entrances where you didn't need steps. That doesn't mean there aren't any. I just didn't see them as I was going in. Um, and for folks who can do a few steps, there is a second floor to this shop that is only accessible by staircase. Now the shop owners are extremely nice and I'm I'm sure they would help you with anything that was on that floor if you need it, uh, but that is a factor to consider. Also, if you have any vision considerations, uh, the second floor is darker than the rest of the floor. It's kind of, a little bit in the eaves up there and the lighting is kind of dim. Um, I found it hard to differentiate some colors uh, and my eyes are 2020 with no color blindness so you know for folks who can go up and down the stairs that's not a big problem because the light is great in the rest of the store uh, but it is something to be aware of. Um, I think that's it. Is that it in my notes? Yes. There could be other things that I didn't notice, but those are the ones that I noticed right away. Um, and a, a note on accessibility in these yarn stores that I, to that I talk about. I have in the past, I think most of them, talked about accessibility in the stores, at least from a wheelchair perspective, um, because that's I think the most obvious one that I can see, um, especially if I'm just running into the store or I've been there for the first time and therefore I'm a little overwhelmed. Um, but if you have any questions, if you have any concerns about accessibility, physical accessibility to these stores and you'd like more information before visiting them, please feel free to reach out and ask. Um, you can DM me on Instagram. Um, Theoretically, there's a DM function here, but I, I don't know how it works, but um, Instagram's probably your best bet. Feel free to reach out to me if it's a store that I've been to on the Yarn Crawl and you have questions, because I'd rather answer repeat questions, and I'd rather, if I have to, take another visit to the store to take some pictures or ask some questions of the shop owners, rather than 
you wasting time getting to some place that you can't actually navigate, if that makes sense. So if you have any questions about anything, <laughs> that's a little broad, but if you have specific questions about accessibility at these locations, especially the Western Connecticut Yarn Crawl stores, I can get to any of them easily to double check things for you. So just let me know. Uh, I did buy five, buy, I did buy yarns at Stars Hollow Yarns. I did buy um, some Farmer's Daughter fibers because I've been kind of keeping an eye on her Instagram feed. <laughs> um, this is her Juicy DK base, which is 100% Superwash Merino uh, in the color Porch Pumpkin. And it's, it's beautiful burnt orange. You can tell it's a, it's not a bright orange like my shirt. It's more of like a fall leaves orange, uh, which is great. This will probably end up being a textured hat, which is like the dream I had when I picked it up <laughs> in the store. And then I also bought um, some Round Mountain Fibers, um, which is a hand dyer from Vermont that I hadn't heard of. Um, it's just this 100% uh, superwash merino in a dark gray. It's nearly black. Like, it looks pretty black against my shirt. Um, because I was on a hunt for black fingering weight yarn on this crawl, and nobody seemed to have it. I'm guessing it's just one of those things where it's so obvious to have that you don't think about it all the time. It was just very weird that nobody had any. Because there is a colorwork hat in my queue. Um, that is done. I want to say it's like little, little trees. But um, I have this leftover from a sweater project. Um, this is Grenin Gargoyles in the shiny penny colorway. Uh, that I wanted to do little trees in with a a black or a dark gray background, and I think this would work really well for that color work. So that's the plan there. Get all these yarns out of the way. Um, yes, so we did spend a lot of time in that store just exploring because it was a new store, um, which is always fun. And then we went over to In Sheep's Clothing in Torrington, Connecticut, which is our closest by drive time yarn store now. <laughs> our local yarn store was New England Yarn and Sprindle. You... So yes, so we're very familiar with her store and um, she's had the Noro yarns before. But I think there was a new Noro book out recently, so she had a lot of stock and she had a lot of samples in Noro yarn, and I'd seen it crocheted in one of the previous yarn stores, and it just kept niggling at the back of my brain. So I bought three of these Noro Ito yarns. Now, as a rule, I don't like singles, uh, but it just looks so good crocheted that I'm gonna crochet a blanket with this. So they're kind of a fade. Let's see if I can hold all three of these at once. So they're kind of fade colors. This one is showing much darker on camera than it is in real life. Um, but like there's a, a mostly green one, a kind of greens and purple one, and then a mostly purple one. So that was my big splurge of the yarn crawl. Um, the only justification I have is I'm on the last couple of magic cakes for the granny stripe blanket. And so the end is in sight. Um, 
and that'll be my next crochet blanket pattern. And then I also won a prize, because um, most of the stores have their own daily prize drawings, or they've got a bunch of prizes that they'll draw at the end of the yarn crawl. And my mom went to go pick it up for me because uh, I'm working during all the shop hours. And so she got to pick my prize and she picked uh, this sock yarn. Sorry, the light is reflecting so much. Kind of blues and grays um, with a basic toe up sock. And I think I'm going to do a giveaway with this, um, kind of towards the end of November. Watch my Instagram for it because I don't know when my November episode is going live. Um, cause I think this would be a good seasonal winter sock if you want to join in any of those festive sock knit alongs and you're not a Christmas color person. Um, so yeah, it comes with a, a basic toe up sock pattern um, by Universal Yarns. I don't know if this is gonna focus, but that's the yarn company. And pretty cool. And then we finished up at um, Knit and Pearls in Avon, Connecticut. Uh, they're a great store. They always give you a little goodie bag with snacks in it. So the, the pin was in there, a coupon, and there's usually like a couple of Hershey Kisses or a couple of, you know, like mini, like a Hershey and a Crackle. Um, some years they give tea, but I don't know if they're doing the tea anymore. Um, it wasn't in our little goodie bag, but... Um, yeah, it was good to see them. It was, uh, they had a trunk show going. I can't remember the name of the yarn company now. Um, but they also carry, uh, needle felting supplies and mom got a, uh, Santa from Going Gnome. So we turned in our passports and we were done with the crawl. I love that yarn crawl. It's a nice little especially since we have been to the stores so often now. It's like a familiar little routine, even if we don't spend a huge ton of time doing this crawl or even in the shops because we've been there so often. Um, but yeah, it's super fun. And if a yarn crawl in your area is doable for you, I recommend the experience. It, They kind of, it's kind of like yarn store open house where they, you know, they do special things for the crawl, at least for the yarn crawls that I've been on. Um, so that's really fun to do. So the next thing uh, in my notes is dye stuff. And I have a huge box of dye stuff to show you. <laughs> uh, I did my first indigo dye. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I used pre-reduced indigo crystals from Dar Dharma Trading Company because it's a very quick prep time as opposed to a traditional fermentation process. Um, in the future, I will be reducing the amounts in the recipe on the Dharma website because I could have... If I had the energy and the materials to keep going, I could have kept dyeing probably another amount of stuff as this that I'm about to show you. So I, and I don't currently have a way of keeping a vat viable. Um, so I ended up disposing of a pretty active dye vat still, um, which is a shame. But, if you can't continue, you cannot continue. Um, so I would do either a half or even a quarter of the amounts that is in the recipe on Dharma. I used a five gallon bucket that I got at Home Depot for a couple bucks. 
Um, and yeah, because I'm about to show you a truly absurd amount of things for one day of indigo dyeing. So the first thing I'm going to show you is fabric. Fabric would absolutely do indigo dyeing again. Um, it's a relatively straightforward dye process, and then the hard part, the rinsing out of the excess indigo particles, is really easy if you have a washing machine. So I did for, I just threw all the fabrics in the washing machine, I did a, a hot cold wash, longest setting, put them in the dryer, on high heat, and then I did another hot cold wash, and then I put them back in the dryer on high heat. And I did a crock test with one of these pieces of fabric that was small enough that I could just fold it and like stick it like in the waistband of my jeans to see if it would rub off blue on me, and it didn't. So fabrics are good. So I did a bunch of solid, semi-solid dye, um, the biggest of which is this raw silk noil fabric I got from Dharma Trading Company. Uh, it's not quite solid because it was a huge piece of fabric to be shoving into a five gallon bucket. Uh, I did have to dye the middle a second time because it was, it didn't really pick up any dye, but it's this nice sort of semi, semi-solid dye. There's some really nice spots like this where like some of it was dyed twice and some of it wasn't. Uh, this is destined to, destined to become a shirt at one point. Uh, likely a button-down shirt. Like a casual, casual button-down shirt. Because this is a a rough textured fabric. I don't know if you can see it. Stop looking at my face camera. So that's the first thing. And then I've got these. Um, a lot of them are these just little scrap pieces. Sorry the lighting is so weird. I'm not using the studio lights today because it's sunny enough. Um, but yeah, some of these are cotton, some of these are linen. Here's a linen. bunch of them. Some of them were previously dyed with other things, and this one's not the best, but I didn't like what it was before, so blue was better than what it was before. And this one, I, th I think this one is one I just put in the vat and then walked away because I had to do other management of dye materials, uh, so there was like an air bubble at the top. And these all came out a beautiful color. They're all lighter than what they looked like before going into the wash, but um, but it's a beautiful, beautiful blue. And it's funny because it, the association with this color now in 2019 is, oh, it's a lovely denim blue. Well, denim is this color because it used to be dyed with indigo. Uh, so it's just funny that like this, the association in the modern day is backwards. This this is an indigo blue <laughs> that denim happens to be the color of because it was dyed with indigo back in the day. It's not anymore, but back in the day. And then my notes fell asleep. So let's wake them up. And then I also did 
a sort of shibori resist dye with drawn threads on um, this muslin that I had made for my weaving project. Um, you could, I just did a running stitch up vertically in a bunch of places and it turned out really good. I did end up uh, altering the sides because the side was a little too wide uh, at the armhole. Um, so it looks a little bit different than when I pulled it fresh out of the vat, but um, this is very wearable and I'm glad I saved this muslin because now it's a cool shirt that I can just wear. Uh -oh. I knocked something off this little table. So if you are planning on experimenting with dyeing and you're also a sewist with muslins hanging around and they fit you, that's a cool way to kind of get double duty out of those muslins. Hang on, let me pick up the thing that I dropped without dropping everything else. Um, and then I did a bunch of other sort of shibori slash resist dyes. I don't know if there are specific techniques related to shibori, so I don't want to just say shibori, but, um, resist dye techniques. And a lot of the, because I could do a lot of pieces all at once because I took a bunch of the previously dyed um, linens and cottons and played around with over dyeing them with the indigo. So I've got this set of four. These were previously dyed with, um, I don't know specifically what, but things that turned out either just, just off white or a very light yellow or a light tan and I just did a simple fold and then I used I used sample laminate flooring squares from Home Depot that you can get for free um this one was one close to the top so you can see the size of that square I want to say it's like a four inch square so these four linens with the resist dye are going to be trimmed and hemmed and made into napkins because I really like how they turned out and I have a set of indigo dyed napkins that I currently use in my lunchbox for work. So it would be nice to have some linen companions to those cotton ones. Let's fold these back up. And then these are the rest of my resist dies. One of these, this one, was in the same bundle as those napkins, but I don't know. I just felt like this was the odd one out of the set, so I'll use that for something else. Um, what else did I have? I did some... kind of did a fold and then folded it into a triangle and put the two squares kind of off center like in the middle so there was a point sticking out and the ends sticking out the other side so I got some pretty cool resist die patterns that way This was previously dyed with just some rusty nails. I'll fold 
little bit later. And then there's this one. This one didn't get a whole lot of dye, but it does have a cool kind of gradient effect where you get less and less dye because of how I folded it. Oh, completely out of focus. Let that go. Okay, let's move it a little slower. That's better. And that's all the fabrics, but I would definitely dye uh, fabric again. Um, and then I dyed a whole bunch of yarn, which I'm less enthused about. Not because of the colors, love the colors, but the rinsing is kind of torture. So I did a sweater's quantity of this Targi from Green Mountain Spinnery. It, it's a bunch of uh, stock that they had up for sale a couple of years ago. So I bought it, I think, half price. So I have five skeins of this. And this Targi is pretty lanolin-y. And I'm still getting blue hands just with minimal handling of this yarn. So I think my hypothesis is it needs to do some more hot water rinsing because I think the lanolin is holding on to the extra dye particles. Um, which means if I were to make a garment out of this now and wear it, I would be blue. Which is not ideal. Um, let's see. Can you see on the camera? Like my fingertips are blue just from this yarn. I mean, it's not as bad as it was, but it's still blue fingertips <laughs> just from picking up this yarn. So that's my hypothesis, that it needs some more hot water rinsing. If you are an experienced indigo dyer and you happen to be watching this and you've worked with sheepy sheepy yarns with your indigo dyeing, please give me some advice because so much rinsing. So blue. Um, I also dyed, well, I over dyed some BFL. Um, I over dyed this skein of BFL. And this, I mean, it turns my hands a little bit blue, but not as bad as the Targi. Um, this was previously dyed a yellow. Not a great yellow, though, so there are some green parts. But it's not a full green. And then I had two minis from my woad dyeing. Um, after washing the woad dye, the BFL tweed wasn't blue at all, so I just over dyed it blue. And then the regular BFL was still a little bit blue, so I left a little bit of the woad visible. Camera. No, I don't want you to focus on my face. I want you to focus on this. There we go. So you can see there's a little bit of blue from the woad. And then I just kind of dip dyed the rest in the indigo. So I just have this little bit here. That's a woad. Because my woad didn't have a whole lot of pigment. And then I over dyed this hand spun skein of Mashem, I think it is. It was a light gray. So I don't know if this camera is going to really show it, but it does hold the color a little bit differently than the BFL. 
because the BFL was white and this was a light gray. Uh, and then I dyed my mohair skeins that I bought at Connecticut Sheep and Wool from Cold Goats Farm. One of them was part of the onion dye, so that turned out this lovely green. Which I don't know if it's going to focus on because mohair is so fuzzy. Oh hey, look at that. So this lovely green, and my show notes are asleep. Wakey, wakey. And then there was this kind of light gray mohair, which I dyed blue, and this white mohair, which I dyed blue. All distinctly different colors. I'm very pleased with how this green turned out, but I'm also very pleased with how these other skeins turned out. They'll likely be used in something together, possibly a weaving project. And then I over dyed a bunch of cotton, some sugarcane, and some bamboo fibers that had all previously been dyed something else that was just kind of meh. Because um, I do have a bin of a lot of slightly off white cotton sample skeins, so I just dyed a whole bunch of them with the indigo. Why do these all feel slightly damp? That's no good. I'll have to let them hang out to dry. But yeah, none of them are very evenly coated um, because the cellulose fibers, when they're wet, they like to cling to each other and not separate. Um, especially the sugarcane. There were still parts, even when I brought it into rinse, where if I opened it up, it was still green and it needed to oxidize. It was very weird. So yeah, that's a lot of blue fingers. That is a lot of indigo dyeing. And then I did a little bit of uh, pokeberry dyeing uh, because Kalisha from the Quirky Monday Craft cast uh, did a little bit of experimenting with solar dyeing with pokeberries. Um, I just did one mini skein of BFL. I had three or four stalks of berries that I just mashed with water. I put some wet, the, the wet mini skein in, and I left it outside for, I want to say, two or three weeks. It turned a deep reddish purple, but that's not the color it stayed. I then rinsed it out and um, added approximately 8% of the weight of the skein of alum to the water, left it in the sun for two weeks, and this is the color that it is now. I don't know if, the, if it's this color because of the alum, or if it's because it was out in the sun for an additional two weeks. Uh, because everywhere I've read says that pokeberry dyes are not light fast dyes, um, they fade. Um, so it could be just because this had sun exposure for two weeks, it faded the purple color, but it ended up this weird kind of gray. Which I'm not mad about. I just didn't expect it. So that's all my dye experimentation. Hopefully the rest of this podcast episode won't take too long to talk about. But first I'm going to go wash my hands before I touch anything with my blue fingertips.
On to the rest of the crafty stuff. First thing is finished objects, uh, which is very exciting because I have made a concert conscious. So the first thing is finished objects, which is very exciting because I have made a conscious effort to finish a bunch of things. So first thing I'm going to show you is a two-stranded color work hat. I may have shown this to you in the vlog episode last month, but if I did, you get to see it again. Um, this is the hat. This is a uh, machine knit on my brother KH836E knitting machine. Uh, so it was knit flat and then seamed up the back. Um, it's a folded brim. I did the color work with a punch card because the 8 836E is a punch card machine. And then I did four center double decrease points for the crown of the hat because four is an easier number to keep track of than eight when you're working across that many stitches flat on a machine where you have to count where all your decreases are and then move the stitches in. Uh, I do use a garter bar to take off the work and then rehang it when doing decreases because you can't just leave needles out of work, you'll end up with holes. Um, so this is the hat. These are both Once Upon a Corgi yarns. Um, the blue is Dark Like My Soul, and the white is Snow Scout, which was um, recovered from a previous machine knit hat that didn't end up fitting even after wearing it a bunch of times. And this is what it looks like on. It's a bit slouchy. I do have plans to do another machine knit color work hat, but I'm gonna leave off this whole brim. I think... Um, just doing a rolled hem here and then doing the color work would be fine. Um, I mean it is... The gauge between the color work and the stock in it is really the problem and I have no interest currently to work out the gauge this stock in it should have to pull in as much as the color work I mean, it's a nice hat. I will wear it because it is big enough for my head, which is the problem with the other hats. Um, yes, I just think I can do another one pretty easily and just maybe do 10 rows of stockinette before starting the color work. And it's a simple color work. It's just, um, get my face out of there. Just a 131 sort of cross shape, which ends up with these diagonal grid lines. That's a terrible description. But um, yeah, I believe it's the punch card 2 if you're a machine knitter. So that's that. Fix that hair. I also, yesterday, which is why I didn't podcast yesterday, finished a sweater. I finished my Comfort Fade Cardi, which is by Andrea Mowry. Um, I used eight Once Upon a Corgi fingering weight yarns. And I will list them for you now. Color A was Queequeg and Briny Beach. These are the biggest amounts that I have left over. Color B was Tomorrow I Shall Be Fetterless and Lemony Snicket, which are both completely used up. I ran out of them in the color. <laughs> um, and then color C was Miracles and Meatballs. This is all I have left. And... Ghoul Haunted Woodlands of Wear, which I completely used up. And then color D was Dark as a Crow at Night and Dying to Burn at the Stake. So all of these colors, colors were either 
a series of unfortunate events club colorways or Edgar Allan Poe club colorways. Um, so that was eight full fingering weight skeins of yarn and I have these two little half skeins and these tiny little balls. So that's three skeins completely used up. And I should note that I, for the cuffs, it's written to fade all the way back to color A, which I didn't do because the cuffs started here and that's long enough, any longer, and it would have looked weird. Um, and then in the collar, once I ran out of color B, I just substituted color A for the rest of it. So this is the right side, the reverse stockinette is the side that's showing. This isn't really helping you because you're just seeing the collar. It's a raglan cardigan, so just to get an idea of it. I'll put it on real quick for you. It's gonna look a little bit weird over this shirt because the arms are very close fitting and with rolled up sleeves that gives you a weird thing here. Uh, also the collar probably looks really weird with the collar of my shirt that's on right now. So this is what it looks like. I can't push this chair back any further. Um, it comes down to just past my butt. And it is comfortable. The raglan shoulders fit better on this sweater, but I'm still not entirely happy with the fit of raglan. I'm thinking raglans just aren't for me. I do have one more sweater for my Make 9 that is technically a raglan, but it's a Colorwork Star Wars sweater, so I don't care. Um, this is not blocked. The ends are all woven in. I just have the extra ends sticking out um, so that I can block it first and then trim them. And I'm very pleased with how this turned out. So if you have many skeins of fingering weight yarn that are similarly colored or similar enough. Um, you can get some really interesting marls. So this is a marled faded cardigan. Um, I should also note that I did reverse the colors for the collar band portion. It wants you to start with color A, but I knew I would not have enough of the other three colors um, to do it that way. Because you're going to use the least amount of this first color just because of how this collar is shaped. Your short rows get longer as you go through the pattern, so this lays nicely. Um, so I just figured I'd use color A last because I have the most of it, so if I run out of anything early, I can just keep going in color A, which I did. So that is one of my Make Nines finished. So I have finished this shirt, the So Faded, not So Faded, the Comfort Fade cardigan. I have finished other things, but I don't remember what they are. I'll do an Instagram post about it sometime. So this needs to be blocked and have official photos taken of it, but it is done, which is very exciting. And then I whipped out real quick um, this cowl. It's the Simple Seed Cowl by Tony Lipsy. And I did this cowl. It's a crochet, a Tunisian crochet cowl. 
Um, because the BIPOC make-alongs started and I was browsing through the tag and checking stuff out. Um, and there's a lot of really great BIPOC designers out there. And this yarn was actually going to be D-Stash yarn, but I picked it up and went, no, I gotta do a Halloween project. Um, so I found this cowl pattern by Tony Lipsy, and it's Tunisian crochet, so you can see how this yarn plays with the texture of Tunisian crochet. And then she told me something in that pattern that I didn't know, which is that you can do pearls in Tunisian crochet. So this middle green part is actually a kind of Tunisian crochet seed stitch, which is super cool. And then it goes back to Tunisian crochet. Um, she has more than a couple Tunisian crochet patterns if you are interested in Tunisian crochet. Um, this one looked Simple. It is pretty simple once you learn how to do the pearls in Tunisian crochet. And um, it's an easily adaptable pattern. I followed her um, counts across. I didn't follow the counts for how many rows to do because these were all partial balls of yarn. So I just kept going until I ran out. So now I have this lovely crocheted Halloween cowl. And I really like that you can see all three colors kind of at once. So Halloween. So yes. Very, very cool. I don't have finished photos of this yet. Um, I, I always forget how quickly crochet goes because I tend to crochet larger projects, but a tiny cowl if my hand didn't hurt at the end of one weekend, I probably could have done this in less than a week. Um, just because I have to limit how much I'm crocheting because of the wrist movements. But that is that. Oh, and these are, what's the name of the yarn? Blue Ridge Yarns Kaleidoscope. And then I think the colors just had a number. But I had specifically chosen them because they were Halloween looking colors. Uh, I used a USJ 6mm Tunisian crochet hook on that. And it wasn't a very long hook, it was just one of those like 7 inch hooks. Um, and then I finished another item from my Make 9, which is the weaving pattern GWT001 from Get Weaving, which is this kind of sleeveless shirt that I made into a Renaissance Fair vest. Um, this is made out of an assortment of cotton and cotton blended yarns in this sort of pseudo plaid. Um, if I remember, I'll put a picture in here about what this looks like on me. Um, Yeah, so I wove this on my 24 inch Ashford Rigitella loom um, using a 12.5 dent heddle. Um, I secured all the lines where I need to cut by hand and then I actually sewed this all by hand. So all the seams, sewing down all of the seam allowances, all of the trim, well, the trim I sewed onto this by hand, but to create the bias strips, I sewed that on the machine because that's just quicker. And I sewed it by hand because I have a problem on my machine with the fabric bunching up because it's so thick trying to go through my machine. Um, and I really like how this turned out with the hand stitching 
a hand stitched back stitch is a lot more flexible because of the nature of the stitch than an interlocking machine knit stitch. So it works really well for this kind of, you know, loosey goosey woven fabric that kind of shifts around as you wear it. I did make the size extra large. If this was what if this was a normal piece of clothing, I might only do the large, but because this is a t uh, sort of a sleeveless tunic going over a shirt and being belted for costume purposes, I left it bigger. Um, I also left at the bottom, I didn't hem this at all. This fringe on the back here is just the cut warp threads. And then on the front, I just left it at the blanket stitch um, with a reinforcement back stitch underneath it. I think it looks pretty good. My battery is dying. No. So I did the seam at the edge. Uh, differently. Will it focus? There we go. Um, I don't remember what that stitch is called, but it basically butts two um, ends together instead of doing a, a seam that has a seam allowance on the inside. So that is my get weaving vest. And then with some of the leftover cotton, I just did a quick weave, sort of an altar cloth type thing. This will go on top of my dresser. Um, I'm really terrible at estimating amounts, so I have this buffer zone of just green at the end, but it's a green and blue low contrast houndstooth pattern, which I really, really love. So we get to see how fast I can finish this podcast on the remaining battery. I may have to do a bit of a jump to recharge it. Um, so in works in progress, I've started my Redford sweater by Julie Hoover on the knitting machine. I did a bunch of swatches. You'll see this in the video that I'm specifically going to do about that sweater. Uh, but I just wanted to give you an idea of my work in progress. This is the final swatch. This is Green Mountain Spinnery's um, Lana yarn in the colorway Grease. Um, gray. So this is the final swatch, the final gauge. It will be on my LK150, and that is a knit in pieces and seamed um, stockinette and reverse stockinette sweater. Uh, I have made one of them before. It was way too small on me. I gave it to my sister. She wears it. Um, that's it for that. I have been playing a little bit with embroidery just because I was looking on Etsy and I found a bunch of kits that I really liked. So I'm working on this one kit by Cozy Blue on Etsy with these mushrooms and phases of the moon and things. It's really just practice for getting these stitches done well um, because I'm anticipating embroidery in my future as part of my Salazar Slytherin stuff. Okay, it's been a couple hours because I had to charge my battery, so my light might be a little different. We're gonna keep going. So I told you about the embroidery. Cozy Blue on Etsy It's where I got the kit, just in case I didn't get that through. And uh, next work in progress is a little bit of spinning. I have been playing a little bit with my Electric Eel Nano. These are my two bobbins of the white 
yellow and gray Rolags. I'm not sure if I showed them on the podcast before. And now I'm currently working on uh, these little spinning fluffs that I made a million years ago. Um, and here is the Electric Yale Nano with my partial bobbin on it. I haven't been doing a ton of spinning. I have worked on my actual spinning wheel spinning a little bit, but it doesn't look any different, so no sense showing you a partially filled bobbin that doesn't look any different than the last time you saw it. And then I've also been doing a little bit of quilting. I'm working on this half square triangle quilt and I've got four of the squares finished. There are 10 squares total. Uh, nine will be in the quilt and one will be um, like an accent pillow. Uh, and these are done using Moda charm squares that I turned into a half square triangle shapes that I'm now assembling. Um, this is also part of my Make 9. I don't know if I will finish it before the end of 2019, but I want to at least get all the squares finished and all the borders put on the squares. And then we'll see what happens from there. <laughs> Uh, so that's it for works in progress. Um, for works in progress for the rest of the year, I do have one more sweater that I want to start. It'll be started on the knitting machine and then finished by hand with color work. Um... And I have two shirts that I need to sew from my Make 9. Um, but other than those things, I think I'm going to stay focused on finishing things that are already on the needles. I have a shawl on the needles. I believe it's called Rice Fields, um, using some Halloween colorway yarns. I have a pair of Palmer Family Farm socks on the needles. I have my Cozy Memories blanket. I have my Granny Stripe blanket. And I have a um, pinwheel scrap blanket. It's not going to be a blanket. It's going to be a couple of seat covers for my car. Um, and I think that's it. But I'm just kind of zeroing in on those things to kind of clear the deck, so to speak. So that's it for projects. Uh, talk a little bit about other stuff. Stuff I'm watching. Um, right now I've been in kind of a start and stop series cycle where I just start a bunch of things and don't finish anything, but I did watch The Dark Crystal Age of Resistance, which is super great, and if you haven't started it yet, you ought to, because it's delightful and amazing. And then stuff I'm listening to is a long list. I've actually just edited out a bunch of things that I've been re-listening to. Um, but it's been a lot of book listening um, since I last talked to you about books that I'm listening to. So at the top of the list um, are books that came out of the inclusivity and diversity discussions happening on Instagram and the knitting community. Um, a lot of people have been ooh, passing around the suggestion for White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo, uh, which is narrated by Michael Eric Dyson. Um, so I did listen to that, uh, but that's not the end all be all, of course. Um, so I also listened to, um, right away, uh, Race Matters by Cornel West, 
narrated by Cornel West. Um, And that's a book that it took me a long time to finish it because there is just so much packed into every single sentence that he writes. It's one of those books where I would listen to it for 20 to 30 minutes and then just have to kind of put just noise on so that I could absorb everything that he was saying. It's an incredibly powerful book and honestly that's the book that should be being passed around <laughs> in this diversity and inclusivity discussion because it's important. Um, it's also, I also listened to the 25th anniversary edition, which came out a few years ago, like three-ish years ago, two, three years ago, something like that, um, where he writes a foreword on it, um, as a comparison to what the political climate is of today and the political climate of when he wrote the book. And, um, yeah, it's important words. Um, so I'm really glad that I own it so I can go back and re-listen because I think that's going to be something that I'm going to need to really listen to a couple of times to absorb everything. And then everything else down here <laughs> is uh, fiction. Um, so I listened to The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller, narrated by Fraser Douglas. Um, and then I ended up returning a book on Audible. So I had a free credit and I got uh, a copy of Dracula and Carmilla. Um, Dracula by Bram Stoker and Carmilla by um, L. Sheridan Le Fanu, both of which I have read before, but it was really nice to get a refresher. Um, Dracula is narrated by Clive Hayward, and um, Alison Larkin narrates uh, Carmilla in this particular um, edition, and I chose that edition because you get a two-for-one they're great vampire stories. And it was really interesting listening to Dracula as it was written. Because I think audio really lends itself well to that multiple narrators, multiple forms. Because it's not a straight narrative if you haven't read Dracula. It's journal entries, diary entries, um, recorded notes by doctors, newspaper clippings. It's it's really interesting. And I think the folks producing this particular audiobook had a lot of creative input on how those things were represented by the narrator. It's really good. Uh, and then I listened to Eldest by Christopher Paolini, narrated by Gerard Doyle, which is the second in the Aragon series. Or, I'm sure that series has a name, but I don't know what it is. Um, that took me a long time to get through, because a lot happens in that book. I know I've read it, but I didn't remember pretty much any of it. Um, so I'm really excited that I'm listening to these through the library. And then... Um, also through the library, I listened to The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis, narrated by Michael York, um, because those are just feel-good, easy, first-thing-in-the-morning books to listen to. And I'm working on uh, The Horse and His Boy by C.S. Lewis, uh, narrated by Alex Jennings. Um, yes. And I think that's going to do it for this podcast. Um, I think I'm going to invest in a second camera battery, so I don't have to do this thing where I come back a couple hours later to finish filming 
this. Um, so show notes and everything are over at freakishlemon.com. Come join us in the Ravelry group. Just search Freakish Lemon in the groups tab. You'll find us. Uh, you can follow me as Freakish Lemon on Instagram and Ravelry. And links to all these things will be in the down bar here on YouTube or somewhere around here if you're watching this somewhere else. And uh, if you are interested in following along with what I'm doing, please hit subscribe here on YouTube for new videos. Maybe even that notification bell if you feel like it. Um, yeah, that's going to do it for this episode. Goodbye.